asked before by previous shippers, I'd like to have an opportunity to answer those as well. So. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Mr. Sharp. <coughs> Excuse me. Vice Chairman Buttrey, Commissioner Mulvey, good afternoon. And we certainly pass on our condolences to uh, Chairman Nottingham and his family, the Thank loss you. of his brother. As described in our written submission, AECC is keenly interested in the reliability of rail transportation. Uh, three times in the past 14 years, and uh, like I said, we've had ownership in power plants in Arkansas that uh, burn Powder River Basin coal since the late 1970s. So we're looking at a 30-year history from our standpoint of shipping Powder River Basin coal to the state of Arkansas to produce electricity. Uh, we, up until 14 years ago, we didn't have a situation where the failure to get coal to our power plant caused us to have to limit the electrical output of the plant. But 14 years ago up to today, we've had three different instances where this has occurred, where the failure by the railroads to deliver coal to our power plants has caused us to limit the electrical generation out of that plant. And of course, when that happens, we've, we've got to get that electricity generation made up from some source so we're either running natural gas plants or we're buying power uh, off, of the, off of the power market at substantially higher prices. And in this most recent episode, which really for us is kind of continuing on today, I mean, we're still uh, incurring costs as a result of the rail problems that started in 2005. Uh, in addition to using natural gas and buying uh, power off the spot market, off of the power market, uh, we have turned to foreign coals as a way of trying to mitigate some of the additional costs that our members have to pay on their electric bills. And, and that, to, to a certain extent, that has been helpful. Uh, and of course, having these kind of restrictions where we're not able to run the plant like it was planned to run, on the fuel it was planned to run, very disruptive to our operations, uh, dramatically affects our costs and what our members pay on their electric bills. And it also produces distortions and adverse impacts that ripple through the economy in general. Uh, the, the real good example of this is this, like I said, I would say current crisis that we're really kind of still in that's ongoing from uh, 2005, uh, but when that disruption began in May of 2005, uh, we were pushed again to limit the output of our coal-fired plants and push towards using more natural gas generation. And as that year progressed and this became a long-term situation, uh, or it became obvious that this was going to be a longer-term situation, uh, the Gulf Coast was also hit by Hurricanes Rita and Katrina. And so here are the utilities out there buying natural gas, uh, which is really is a supply and demand market, and driving up, driving down the supply and driving up the cost of natural gas, which increased the difficulty and hardship that industries and individuals who depend on natural gas were suffering uh, due to the hurricane situation. So uh, there again, this, this doesn't happen, happen in an isolated island it's all interrelated with the economy and the competitive of competitiveness of uh, American industries. In addition to the reliability issues, we're also aware of the central role that efficiency improvements have historically played in the ev evolution of PRB coal transportation under the Staggers Act. For the past 27 years, a long series of productivity improvements have benefited carriers and shippers alike reducing costs, lowering the floor for competitive rates, and applying downward pressure on the cost factors that enter into these rate cases. Uh, we just want to point out to the board that, uh, and it's been, been referred to a couple of times here already by other speakers, the pivotal role that coal shippers have played 
in bringing about some of these efficiency improvements that have benefited the shippers as, as well as the carriers. Expenditures by coal shippers and the mining companies, uh, in some cases, on larger cars, aluminum cars, additions to loading and unloading trackage, uh, have been critical components of increases in net tons per car and the net tons per train that the railroads are able to haul. Uh, in addition, coal shippers and mines have invested in technological advancements such as automated car identification systems, uh, automated precision unloading and loading systems, and we've also supported the efficiency improvements that the railroads were, were, uh, were trying to achieve by allowing the railroads to redirect uh, empty sets of cars in the PRB. And uh, Mr. Korleski referred to this earlier, U UP calls that their FLIP program. And uh, like I said, it's no small thing for a shipper to basically give up control of his sets of cars that he owns and allow the railroads to put those in places other than where they were originally intended. but. Uh, recognizing that that does improve the overall efficiency of the system, uh, many shippers have allowed the railroads to do that. And also, uh, there's something that really hadn't been mentioned today, but uh, something, a program that the railroads undertook some time ago and uh, has certainly helped the efficiency of the overall flow of unit trains out of the PRB to the, to the uh, power plants is the use of distributed power. But that also, there were also some things that the utilities had to do in that respect by rearranging sets of cars and maintenance schedules. And when you've got everything set up, your entire system set up on, on the length of trains being this long and that gets changed, there's a lot of things that you've got to change. So uh, there's a lot of cooperative efforts there between shippers and, and producers that have uh, have helped and it's it's not that the coal shippers have just been sitting back and harvesting the benefits of these improvements. We've done our share of the planting as well. We are quite familiar with rail efficiency and, and ways to achieve it and we certainly hope that that's going to continue in the future. And looking back at our experiences with burn restrictions, we found a pattern that we believe provides some important guidance regarding the causes of rail reliability problems. Basically, before the last round of big rail mergers, the only time that we had to place a burn restriction on our plants, in other words, limit the electrical output of the plants, was when we had a, a very widespread flooding situation that disrupted rail service, not unlike what happened here just a few weeks ago in the, in the Midwest part of the country. This was in 1993 and 94, and it was a little worse as, as far as the impact on the railroads than the episode that we've just uh, are just getting finished with uh, as far as flooding in the Midwest. Uh, even at that time, uh, the amount of coal that we had in inventory allowed us to pretty well ride through that without too many problems. Like I said, we did have to place burn restrictions on our plant, but it was for a very short period of time, and there were some additional costs to us and our members, but it, it, was, it was tiny compared to what we've, we've had since then. Uh, since that time, we've had two much more serious episodes, the meltdown after the UPSP merger, and then these joint line problems that I've uh, been referring to that began in 2005. These episodes were huge in comparison to past natural disasters, uh, and both appear to have resulted directly from decisions made by rail management rather than any type of uncontrollable force. To understand how this evolution came about, it's important to look back at what happened with the rail mergers and the so-called bottleneck cases. In a typical rail merger, the railroad would obtain an increased length of haul due to single line service, and they'd achieve cost savings due to the elimination of redundant capacity. From the bottleneck cases, the railroads were able to insulate their long haul moves against possible competition on portions of the route. When you put longer hauls on fewer railroads, together with fewer options for competing carriers to step in when things go wrong, it's not really surprising that the rail system as a whole has, has tended to become less reliable. 
if something goes wrong with the performance of one or more of the railroads, it can really go wrong because the market forces that might otherwise mitigate the problem have been constrained or eliminated. Excess capacity is scarce and shippers have no practical way to separate the part of a large railroad that may be working from the part that isn't. In our written submission, we discuss why it's important for the board to maintain accountability by the railroads for their decisions and actions and not just send the bill to shippers by pursuing a strategy that rel would rely solely on increased coal inventories to counteract unstable rail service. We offer specific suggestions for action the board could take to address the causes rather than the symptoms of railroad liability problems. These include reconsidering the conditions imposed in past merger cases, applying the competitive access remedies for poor service contemplated in the original bottleneck decision, and possibly changing the bottleneck criteria in light of changed circumstances. In offering these suggestions, we'd like to emphasize three things. First, we're not talking about any type of re-regulation. That's a word that re-regulation has been wagged about a lot recently, and, and that simply doesn't apply to what we're, what we're proposing. What we're talking about is making measured use of market forces within the current scope of the board's authority and discretion to counteract the problems that have been observed. Second, we're not asserting that, asserting that the board made any error in the judgments that it made previously in these areas. What we're saying is, like in the case of collective rate making by motor carriers, the situation has changed so that things that were found to be appropriate before are no longer appropriate now. Third, in proposing these changes, we believe there is a significant common interest between shippers and railroads. Probably none of the railroad witnesses here today would jump up and say, you should get rid of the bottleneck criteria. They're not, they're not going to do that. Or, nor would they say, you should make more liberal use of competitive access. But if they sit back and look at the situation and do the math, we believe they'll see that with the large and increasing volumes moving out of the PRB, the real value associated with operating efficiency improvements is increasing. It was certainly valuable even back when they had excess capacity, but these efficiency improvements are going to be even more valuable now. And the wisdom in, of investing in capacity increases on efficient route segments is becoming more doubtful. We believe our suggestions will benefit railroads in these areas. Of course, we expect shippers will re receive benefits as well. As, volumes in, as volume increases, Unleashing market forces becomes more of a win-win for railroads and shippers alike, as has already been the experience where market forces has, have been unleashed under the Staggers Act. We all saw what happened when, when that occurred. I note that many shippers have expressed a concern and belief that physical opportunities for head-to-head -head rail competition no longer produce the vigor of competitive conduct that has been observed in the past. To the extent that such a reaction in competitive vigor has occurred, the board may need to open the spigots of competition wider than it would have in the past in order to obtain the desired remedies. Appropriate use of market forces should provide a physical way to address unreliability and, <clears throat> and the related problems that we have seen that arise. It should also create a climate that shields railroad management from undue pressure from the financial community for short-term results. I urge the board to consider carefully the ways in which past actions, individually and cumulatively, may have contributed to the increasing volatility of rail service performance that has been observed, and to embrace the application of appropriate market forces as a remedy. I appreciate this opportunity to participate in the board's consideration of these issues. Look forward to answering any questions you may have. <laughs>